both the light in the statue's eyes and the flame uh, are just triggered by me walking somewhere near them. Uh, so sensors can be quite magical really. But uh, sensors are a big subject, so uh, this video is really just about introducing the basics uh, and then looking at ones that I've used in my machines, uh, the various successes and disasters I've had. So, uh, as usual, to start with, here's the chapter list so you can jump to any particular point you're interested in. Although it's uh, rather magical the way that electrical gadgets can be turned on and off without a switch, um, a lot of sensors are actually very simple devices. This is actually a tilt sensor. And it's not complicated at all. All it is, is a sort of little pendulum. And when it touches the ring, it rings the uh, alarm. And then there are pressure sensors. Um, uh, my air compressor, it pumps up, uh, but it has to switch itself off when it gets to the right pressure. Uh, so it has a sensor inside. Well, air pressure sensors can be equally simple. So this is my um, simple-minded pressure sensor. It's just a rubber glove and um, here's my um, compressed air. So if I put a tube in the glove and uh, tie it on with a cable tie, Now, when I uh, switch the when I switch the air on, um, it completes the circuit. Uh, this one's quite sophisticated because I can adjust the pressure uh, by adjusting this angle. So I can make it lower pressure by going down. Well, I'll see what happens if I try and make it a higher pressure. Very satisfying. Of course, <laughs> for my air compressor, this wouldn't be much good because you need a switch that turns off when you get to the high pressure. Um, you'd need a, a changeover switch or a relay to do that. Then there are simple liquid level sensors. This is just copper, tinned copper. Um, but the two sides have these intermeshing lines, if you like. Uh, so there's a large area of contact between the two sides. And because most liquids have some sort of residual um, electrical conductivity, this large area of contact is enough to change the resistance between the two sides. So, um, so if I now dip it into water, immediately sets off the alarm and of course it's still wet now so <laughs> with this one to get it to stop you have to dry it off <laughs> quite thoroughly another simple sensor magnets uh, can also make simple sensors so in this glass tube um, they're just uh, two conductors that aren't quite touching in the middle uh, one's made of steel, so uh, it's uh, magnetic. Uh, so if I bring a magnet close to it, if you look closely, I think you can just see it move when I do that. Well, these are very useful. Um, these are called reed switches, and uh, I'll talk more about them later in the video. But again, it's a quite a simple idea. So then there are temperature sensors, like on electric fire. So uh, it turns the fire off when the room gets warm. Well, this is my homemade version. Um, so at the moment it's cold in here. So uh, the fire's on. But we'll just heat it up a bit. And What's happening, it's easier to see when it's dead side on, 
is that the metal has bent away like that. So it's called a bimetallic strip because what I've done, I've riveted two thin bits of metal together. So it's steel on this side and uh, brass on this side. And they expand at different amounts as they get hot. So uh, the brass expands more than the steel and that's why the metal bends. Even opto sensors, the sort of invisible beams that detect burglars or products on a conveyor belt, uh, can actually be quite uh, simple. So this one, uh, it's quite an old-fashioned one, it's called a LDR, a light dependent resistor. And you can see it looks very like the liquid level sensor, uh, though this one's actually made of um, a semiconductor, because um, a lot of semiconductors are sensitive to light. Um, my friend Rex once sawed the top off a power transistor and made that into a light sensor. Um, anyway, uh, I'll connect this one up. It's rather irritating. It just makes a noise all the time. There's enough light to trigger it. Um, so there it is. And if I block out the light, uh, it stops. Um, I don't know quite how to prove that it's the light. You can see as it gets darker. Or maybe with a bit of black fabric this would work better. Well, this uh, opto sensor is a bit crude, really. Um, real ones are considerably more sophisticated. Of course, today there are also high-tech sensors like the passive infrared movement sensors, uh, the MEMS, accelerometers um, and many other uh, posh sorts of sensor. Uh, but with all sensors, the devil is in the detail. Some real sensors are very similar to the homemade tilt sensor that I made. Uh, this one came out of an arcade machine. It's to just sense if people are shaking the machine about. And there are smaller, um, neater versions are now made. Um, I should say I've connected the sensor uh, to this character. Um, it's a very early machine I made. It's called Distraction. Um, he's just going to register when the sensors come on. So then there are sensors uh, in electric fires to detect when they tip over. The old-fashioned electric bar fires have them in. So most angles it won't work at all, but if you get it finally upright, the circuit, and the fire can come on. The great thing about this one, it's rated at 20 amps, so it can take the full current of the fire. Of course, then there are smaller um, tilt switches. Originally, these were a little tubes of mercury, um, like this. But of course, you can't do that now. So um, now we have uh, a lot of ones a bit like this, really tiny. Um, and they have uh, just, a, surprisingly, it works with just a little steel ball inside. The ball rolls from one end of the sensor to the other. So as I tip it up slowly up, and tip it down again and this one's accurate to about two degrees it's amazing pressure switches aren't that different from uh, my simple model with the rubber glove either of course there's no rubber glove but they do have rubber diaphragms this is one this is the it's actually a plastic diaphragm here. The air goes in here and it pushes against, this is just an ordinary micro switch in there. You can actually see the white button of the micro switch there. Now this will need uh, some compressed air. So I've got uh, an airline here with a regulator. Um, so I turn it on the air. Now, if you look at the diaphragm closely as I increase the pressure, Of 
Well, these diaphragms are made in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Um, these are two ones I've got actually for measuring vacuum. The diaphragm is in the middle of each one. Um, this is another one. The diaphragm is in there. Uh, this one's extremely low pressure, which is quite fun because it means that uh, I can just switch it by blowing into it. Um, and actually, even the switch that uh, switches on my compressor uh, and switches it off to keep the pressure right uh, is a, another diaphragm. Um, this is actually a copper diaphragm bellows in there. And it's pushing against this very powerful spring in the back there. So this is a much higher pressure than the other ones I've been looking at. Uh, I'll hook this up to the compressed air. I'll just turn that's easier to see now and again as I increase the pressure you should see this bar move up and it'll go click that's the vital click so then the compressor would be running the electrical contacts are in the other side so that now if I uh, let some air out I'm reducing the pressure but it doesn't switch again until it gets to quite a lot lower pressure to there. So the smaller spring is the differential, the pressure difference between the compressor cutting out at high pressure and cutting back in when the pressure's dropped again. Unlike the last two sorts of sensors, uh, level sensors aren't generally like the simple one I showed at the start of the program, uh, though they're not much more complicated. They generally have uh, a magnet in a little uh, cylinder wrapped round a reed switch at the bottom here. So if that goes down to the bottom, uh, the alarm goes off. So uh, in use, uh, if I say have it in this glass of water, it'll ring the alarm until I put some water in. And uh, I use a sensor like this in uh, Test Your Nerve to check that there's water for the dog to dribble, which you'll see in a minute. Well, these sensors come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Uh, this one's actually just like the one in uh, um, my loft for switching the uh, pump on because we're on a well. Um, and there's a float on one side and a weight on the other. And the float tips the switch over, the old mercury switch in there, and that switches on the pump. Uh, this is one, I don't know what this is from the bottom of a pond or something. There's a float inside there which tips up. Actually, these sort of float switches can detect flow as well as level. Uh, this is a flow switch detecting flow through here. So at the moment, it's blocked by this disc, but uh, any flow will push the disc upwards. So it pushes it up, up there. So it lands in front of the reed switch, which is in the, the back here uh, and um, makes the contact. So for temperature, bimetallic strips are still widely used, though they're much, much smaller than the one that I made. Uh, and they use special alloys, uh, a special alloy that hardly expands at all. So the differential expansion is bigger um, than between brass and steel. So if I clamp mine here and heat it up with a heat gun, um, the, the movement should be quite noticeable. So used in um, thermostats and things, uh, 
So the bimetallic strip is in here and the contact is at that end there. Uh, at the moment it's making contact because it's relatively cool. Um, so when I connect it up, he'll buzz and he'll keep on buzzing until I heat this up. That shut him up. Then there's another uh, biometallic device, uh, the little uh, temperature sensors you get in washing machines and other uh, and irons and things like that. Um, I don't think I used to know how they work, but um, uh, they are biometallic. Uh, they're biometallic discs. And um, this is the actual disc. And I hope you can see there's a very slight curvature. It's slightly curved out that way. And what happens is when it heats up, um, this side expands more than that side and it reaches a very particular temperature, the switching temperature, and suddenly it pops. So instead of being domed out the front, it's domed out the back. And so it touches this lever on the switch uh, and uh, that uh, switches the sensor. There are actually many different sorts of temperature sensors, um, but one other that uh, I particularly like is the thermocouple. Now, it's sort of unbelievably simple, really. Um, these two wires are made of different metals. I think you can see they're just welded together at the tip. And really, that, that's all it is. If I connect this to my multimeter and uh, heat it up, it's generating this tiny voltage. And this voltage is very accurately proportional to the temperature. Uh, it's actually the temperature difference between the tip and the end, end of the wires the other junction, if you like, where it joins on to the multimeter. Uh, it's an old effect called the Seberg effect, um, but it's very widely used for measuring temperatures because it can measure up to extremely high temperatures and with different metals um, over different ranges uh, and extremely accurately too. Uh, of course, the voltage is, it creates is very, very tiny, uh, so they have to be used with uh, special um, controllers uh, to convert them into complete sensors. So to make the dog's dribble convincing, the water has to be warm, it has to be the right temperature. So in here, uh, that's the tube the water comes up, and inside his mouth there's a little coil of um, nichrome wire, insulated nichrome wire, and at the end of it there's a thermocouple sensor, and the thermocouple connects down to this controller down the bottom. It's called a PID, P-I-D controller. It's very clever. If I was just to have a bimetal uh, sensor, um, it, it would alternate. The, the water would get too hot and then it would get too cold and get too hot again. Um, but with this PID sensor, it keeps it a very, very accurate um, constant temperature. <laughs> Reed switches are still very useful. Um, I tend not to use the glass ones, they're a bit fragile. Instead I use ones that come in a plastic uh, case. And uh, 
And these are usually sold with magnets um, to go with them in the same sort of shape. Uh, and, uh, but actually I never buy the magnets that are made for them. Uh, I tend to just use them with rare earth magnets. Um, so this magnet is about the same strength as uh, the one that was made for the uh, the one that was sold for this particular reed switch. Uh, but it, you can also use a much weaker magnet if you want something much, uh, you only need something much closer. This is a tiny little magnet. Um, switching it, I suppose, at about four mil. Um, or at the, at the other extreme, um, if you have a whole load of magnets, it's really nice that you can... I'm switching at about 70 mil there, I think. Particularly easy to use are these rare earth magnets with holes in the middle. <laughs> They're widely available now, uh, and they certainly make fixing them much easier. Um, that's a five mil one, uh, and this is a little three mil one. So they're very versatile, um, and they come in different sizes. That's a fairly standard size. This is a smaller one, a miniature one. I actually use more of these ones. Then you can get cylindrical ones uh, that you can sense the end, so you can have them poking through a bit of board or something, uh, and you get miniature versions of those. Uh, they're all useful for different uh, things. Then you can also get um, surface mount ones. Uh, and these, these don't have the same range. So there's one thing I find these surface mount reed switches particularly useful for, is sensing across a long line, if you like. So all these surface mount reed switches are connected in parallel with each other. And now, with my magnet, um, if I anywhere that I cross the line, it'll t uh, activate the reed switch, um, and so this you know the line could be a foot long. Uh, I found it particularly useful when I was making pirate practice. I needed a sensor in the obstacle to detect when a boat got too close, so I had a, a rare earth magnet in the boat and a row of these little sensors at the bottom of the obstacles. Uh, it's a difficult thing to get something small enough um, that would measure across this whole line, but it did work beautifully. Uh, uh, a couple of details about these reed switches. Um, one is that they're weaker in the middle than they are the uh, side of the So there's a sort of a sort of dead spot in the middle. Uh, just more seriously, um, they, uh, if I move this one in slowly, this actually triggers, I can now move it back out quite a few millimetres before it switches off. I should think there was four or five millimetres difference between the switching on point and the switching off point. This is called hysteresis. Uh, it's a sort of basic property of magnetism. Um, and in some situations, it can be a problem uh, and affect the precision of sensors like these. So generally, they're not used for highly precise work. The sensors I've looked at so far all make a basic switch contact uh, to complete the circuit. So they can be used with any old voltage. But a lot of sensors are powered, uh, require power. So then there are three wires come out of them, the positive, the negative, and the output. Well, there is a great range of sensors uh, designed specifically for five volts for Arduinos and things um, that are very good value. Uh, and there's a brilliant book that tells you fun things to do with them. Uh, but I have to admit, I've hardly used any of them. Um, I started long before Arduinos were around 
and grew up with uh, industrial sensors and industrial electronics. Uh, my programmable logic controllers are native 24 volts, as are the uh, industrial sensors. Uh, and as this video is really uh, based on my experience, uh, these are the sensors that I know about uh, and I'm now going to describe. Um, they can be used with uh, Arduinos. Um, many of them have a very wide voltage range uh, of, that they accept as inputs and can be used at 5 volts. Uh, and all the others can be with a few extra components. And I'll show you how to uh, do that later on in the video. But I thought I should start by just describing the basic types. Though uh, light-dependent resistors are still used, uh, sometimes in street lights for detecting daylight, um, most optical sensors have a light source as well. So in this case, the, there's an LED, an infrared LED in the top here, uh, uh, that sends a, a light to the receiver at the other end. So um, if I connect it up, and break the beam, it triggers the sensor. Well, one reason for this is that um, the, the infrared light uh, is actually modulated. Um, it's switched on and off very rapidly. Um, and the, the receiver will only uh, react to this light. So if I replace the LED with um, just a torch, It has to be this uh, particular frequency of light that uh, the receiver is looking for. Well, this sort is called a through beam sensor, uh, and it's particularly used for very long distances, regularly up to 25 meters. But this one's range is only a rather pathetic four and a half meters. The disadvantage, of course, is that you've got to take wires to both ends. It's much more common to put it all into one. Um, so here you have the infrared LED on one side and the receiver, the sensor, on the other. So I've wired this sensor up so that it's reflecting off um, the reflector here. Uh, so if I break the beam, the sensor is triggered. These ones are called retroflective sensors and they don't have a bad range. Um, I could probably walk away to the back of the workshop and it should stay reflecting. I use a retroflective sensor to trigger the no smoking sign as people walk onto the pier. It's not perfect, the reflector often gets covered in condensation which stops it working until I clean it again. So that's another type of the ones with the reflector, but you don't even always need a reflector. If you get close enough to um, as this particular sensor, um, the light off my hand uh, is enough to reflect back uh, to uh, trigger. And there's a whole range of sensors that just exploit this effect. This is called diffuse um, opto uh, sensors um, using diffused light. And um, some of these have ranges up to two meters. Uh, it's extraordinary, I'm not sure. Yeah, this one's only about uh, four inches. Mummy, mummy, help me. Mummy, mummy, help me. Thank you for participating in our research program. Really, the 
entire anion probe machine was designed around the end gag of the actual anal probe. Um, it doesn't come out that hard, so it couldn't do anybody any serious damage, but I thought it might scare a child, or possibly even knock over a toddler or something. So I added a uh, uh, diffuse opto sensor in here. Um, and the great thing is that I, it was a, quite a posh one where I could adjust the range really accurately. So um, if it senses uh, anything in the way up to about here, um, but if it's just out of the path of the probe, um, it lets the probe work as normal. So, so yeah, very useful things, these diffuse optical sensors. There are more exotic ones, versions. This one is actually f uh, connected to fibre optic. It's uh, called a fibre um, opto sensor. So that will uh, detect when... This one doesn't seem to have a particularly long range. I've never ever used one of these. They're expensive, but uh, they do fit in some awkward places, I guess. Then there are, are these ones that you can buy on eBay for about 10 quid. Um, they're actually door switches. Uh, uh, but they've got a built-in relay, so you can switch quite high-powered things with them. There's no need for any external electronics. Uh, they're very simple. Uh, their range is about... Uh, it's about 75 mil. So the three basic types of opto sensor are through beam, retroflective and diffuse. But the devil is always in the detail. I used lots of different ones. Really each situation is quite a bit of trial and error. It's not detecting the screwdriver uh, when it's close to the sensor itself. Um, but there are many other different subtleties of the different surface that you're trying to reflect off and um, other things as well. iZombie starts by asking you to put your phone in the holder here and then while you're busy fighting off the zombies on the screen it steals your phone um, which I can show you. Um, Um, well, to do that, I had to sense whether the phone was in place and also that the phone has arrived in the bag at the bottom because to get your phone back out... Uh, this bag flops forward and uh, <laughs> you can retrieve it after the machine tells you you're going to lose it for three hours to check whether you are an iZombie or not, of course. So the tricky thing in iZombie was that the sensors had to be very compact uh, and they also had to sense precise distances. So the one that detects the phone in the holder uh, had to detect at a range of practically nothing and the one in the bag had to detect at a range of uh, 10 to 40 millimetres. Um, and so it was quite a bit of uh, trial and error to find sensors to do it. So basically I just had to buy a range of sensors from RS components and find which ones work. The spec doesn't really help that much. Of course there are also miniature versions of all these sensors um, that I also use a lot. So uh, this one is a diffuse one. Uh, the light comes out one side and goes in the other. Oh, that's the LED on that side. You can see by the arrows. Um, this has a range of, I don't know, an inch, a half inch or so. Um, slight drawback of these ones is that they can be affected by uh, daylight. I don't know that it's um, the LED is modulated. They're amazingly good value. Uh, then another common sort is a slot sensor. So on this uh, type, uh, the LED will be in one side and the sensor in the other uh, and it'll detect anything that's uh, um, in between in the slot. 
Uh, and I find these little sensors particularly useful for position sensing. For precise position sensing, there are encoders. This disc has lots of little holes around the edge. Um, and so if I put my slot sensor, uh, it's detecting each hole. So with a microcontroller or PLC, uh, you can count the number of pulses uh, and uh, know the position of, of the disc. Um, this is a relatively old one, a relatively crude one. Today encoders are, are much smaller. Uh, an amazingly good value, these Chinese ones. Um, I bought this one just to play with, really. Um, and this is one pulse per degree. It's just amazingly um, sensitive. Most encoders now can also sense the direction that uh, the shaft is moving in. So um, it, they have two outputs, and I've connected one to green and one to, to red down the bottom here. If it's going clockwise, the, re the red one comes on while the green one is alight. So every time the red one comes on, the green one will be on. 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 Going the other way, it's the opposite. Every time the red one comes on, the green one will be off. On. 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 Uh, these are called A-B sensors uh, and they're very useful because obviously then in the logic of your microcontroller or in my PLCs, I can then uh, decode that to know where, which direction it's going in. But I rarely need this uh, extreme precision in my machines, so I quite often make my own uh, rather more primitive encoders. So in two ton school run I needed to know the position of the car on the track. So um, there's, you can see these stripes, the black stripes up there and then this is a, um, a diffuse miniature opto sensor switching as it goes up and down. Uh, then there's this disc here, uh, oh you can't really see it at the moment, um, and you can see the little slots in there and they're um, activating another sensor which you can hardly see down the bottom. But if you look at the uh, PLC while this is happening you can see the, uh, uh, the inputs counting the pulses as it goes past. Well, despite the enormous variety of optical sensors available, I still very often use inductive sensors. So uh, these, uh, there's a coil of wire inside there and um, with, with a quite high frequency AC um, voltage going through it. And when uh, any metal comes near, it generates uh, eddy currents in the metal. Uh, 
and and that uh, saps some of the power out of the coil, these eddy currents, uh, and it measures the change in the coil that way. Um, well, traditionally, these inductive sensors are large, clumsy things like this, with not a, a very big sensing range, as you can see. Uh, but there are smaller ones. Um, you can get ones that are in the same style as a micro switch, or even better, uh, these little ones. Uh, and I really like these ones. Uh, they're not cheap, um, and their sensing range is about three mil. Uh, but they're very reliable and, and very compact compared to most uh, opto sensors. The other thing that's really good about them compared to reed switches is that they don't have the hysteresis. Uh, their range is very, very precise. So if they switch on here, uh, it's very consistent. So you can get a much more precise positioning with them than you can with a reed switch. Sometimes I don't even have space for one of those, but there are even smaller ones, uh, which I also use a lot of. Uh, these ones have about half the sensing distance, uh, but they are wonderfully tiny. And so I do find uh, quite often that they're the only, only option. Yeah, these have a range of roughly two mil. maybe one and a half. But if the parts are fairly rigidly mounted, um, that's uh, often quite enough. <laughs> you have chosen to enter the Mobility Masterclass. I have trouble with on Mobility Masterclass is the one that detects when the camera hits a car. Uh, the camera is mounted on sort of spring mechanism uh, and doesn't always return to precisely the same point. Um, so I tried the aero sensors, I had a micro switch, then I had uh, one of those uh, tiny octo switches, um, and the range was too small. Um, and uh, this is down the third attempt. Uh, I finally got it right with one of the um, tiny uh, inductive sensors, and that's just perfect for this particular thing. But it shows it's not always easy to get uh, sensors right first time. The coin acceptors that I use on my machines also have inductive sensors inside. Um, they're hidden generally, but on this particular model, you can see them. Uh, there are these four coils of wire that um, the coin rolls past as it goes down the slope. And um, each different sort of coin generates a sort of different pattern of electricity in the four coils. And so inside the acceptor, uh, this is compared with ones in its memory uh, to determine what coin has rolled down the slope. Well, I've tried lots of different makes of sensors in the past, uh, these coin acceptors, and uh, I have to say that it's all a bit frustrating, really. Generally, you don't uh, get the software to program them yourself. You have to send them away if you want to change anything. And, and in my experience, they're often a bit oversensitive, so they reject a lot of genuine coins. Um, I've tried various different ways around this, but uh, I think I come to the conclusion, really, I prefer these very, very cheap ones from uh, Taiwan. Uh, 
these ones you do program yourself they're just three buttons on the side here um, and you go through various stages and roll down a number of sample coins to teach the acceptor um, exactly the characteristics you want and you can set the sensitivity as well I just wish they didn't look quite so cheap and nasty though <laughs> Passive infrared detectors have become very common um, for turning outside lights on and that sort of thing. They're detecting movement, human movement, or uh, movement of anything that's warm, really. That's why they're called passive infrared. But they're quite complicated, quite a lot more complicated than the other sensors that I've looked at. Uh, there's quite a lot of electronics inside. Um, the actual sensor is in the middle here. Um, and although you can't see it, it's in two halves. And what it, the sensor's doing, it's comparing the amount of heat on each half constantly and looking for any absolutely microscopic changes uh, between it. And this is helped by this very clever lens, the Fresnel lens. Um, you can see underneath, inside, there are multiple images of, of the torch bulb. So if, if walking across in front of the sensor, there are multiple images of me uh, and the heat that I'm generating uh, that provide the image. So that's the principle of how they work. Um, you can get mains powered ones and lower voltage ones uh, with relays or designed directly to be connected to uh, powerful lights. Um, but uh, you can also get uh, tiny ones um, that I like, uh, that are just a, a circuit board, 12 volt circuit board. And um, if I connect this one up, um, I have to stay absolutely motionless or it'll pick me up. Pick up my Oops. That was my finger. That's the most. Gosh, just talking is enough to do it. Um, just the most fun I've had with this was uh, I once made a grandmother's footsteps game. Um, you have to try and keep up on her without her turning around to look at you. Uh, it works amazingly well. It's difficult. But you can adjust the hardness because you can adjust the sensitivity usually of these uh, PIR sensors. Connecting things to sensors isn't too hard, but um, uh, you do need to look at their spec. Uh, they have trans generally have transistor outputs and can't take much current for a start. Uh, and then you may find that the voltage that the sensor needs uh, for its supply is different from uh, the voltage that you're using uh, for your microcontroller or whatever. Um, so one thing trick that I find useful is, a, is to use a thing called a reed relay. So I looked at the reed switches earlier on, uh, these switches that are switched by magnetism. Well, a reed relay is just one of these with a coil of wire wrapped around it to make it into an electromagnet. It will still work as a conventional reed switch with a magnet. Um, but now, if I connect uh, a power supply to the two ends of the electromagnet, it'll do the same. And that's all that a reed relay is. Uh, they're actually quite tiny things, uh, usually enclosed in plastic like this, uh, only about 20 mil long. So the reason I like these little things is because they're very, very low current. Uh, the 12 volt ones just take about 12 milliamps, so any sensor can power them. So 
the sensor powers the coil uh, and then you just have a simple switch that you can connect to anything you want. Um, the switch in these ones is usually rated at around one amp. So if you want to switch something more powerful, you'd have to have a more powerful relay to switch uh, something else. Or the other thing is you can use um, more exotic things. Where has it gone? Uh, like I had actually on the passive infrared sensor, um, not much bigger, but more expensive. This is a solid state relay that will switch three amps, I think. Uh, I just happened to have that connected for a previous project. Uh, so they're, they're very useful and, and sort of universal. Um, and I use quite a lot of those. Uh, I have a lot of things of 12 volts, but my PLCs are 24. Voltage regulators can also be useful with sensors. Uh, traditionally, they were just these three pin devices. Uh, they're not hard to use or anything, but um, uh, they're a bit limited. I now rather prefer um, these sort of packaged up DC to DC uh, voltage converters. Uh, they come in a huge range of different input and output voltages and currents and you can even get ones that step up the voltage so uh, particularly useful if you've got a 5 volt controller you can step the voltage up to 12 volts to power an industrial sensor. So the other potentially confusing thing about uh, these three wire sensors uh, is that uh, the outputs are transistorized so they're either NPN or PNP. Well what that means is that you either connect the output to the positive or to the negative uh, to power anything. So um, here I've got a little diffuse opto sensor that's switching when I get my finger close to it. Uh, so if I now connect my man here uh, to the output, which in this case is the white wire, like that, I can now either connect uh, the other wire to my MAN to the negative terminal, which I'll try first, and then that's not doing anything. So now I'll try connecting it to the positive terminal. Maybe under. Oh, so this one uh, works when I connect the between the positive uh, and the output, not between the negative. Uh, and that is an NPN output. If I had a PNP sensor, I'd have had to have connected my wire to the negative rather than the positive. You can't harm it by doing it the other way around. Um, and sometimes it's useful, well, with my PLCs, I have to make sure that all my inputs are either NPN or PNP. They're either switching to naught or all switching to 24 volts. But with a read relay, you could just do it by trial and error, I guess, because you're only really interested in uh, the switch terminals that come out the other end. Well, that completes the list of sensors that I have most experience of using in my machines. Uh, I thought I'd end the video with three examples where I had particular difficulty in finding the right sensor for the job. With the doctor, the sensor I had trouble with is the one in the end of the stethoscope. Uh, I think at first it was a push button. That didn't last. Um, I can't remember what I tried next. Anyway, I've ended up with uh, an exotic sensor called a capacitive sensor. This will um, not just detect metal, this detects any material, so um, flesh or clothes or anything. So in a way it's perfect. 
but even I still have trouble with this actually uh, and I think really the root of the problem is anything that's mounted on flexibly on the end of a cord uh, it's very difficult to get it right something that's used continuously by the public all the time uh, I'm on my second one of these capacitive sensors <laughs> the first one had so many repairs as the wires kept getting tugged about So, um, in uh, instant weight loss, I have to detect when the tube has sucked up a corn. And uh, I use a pressure sensor, or rather a vacuum sensor, to do that. Uh, and then there's another vacuum sensor that checks that it's landed on the column. Um, well, for years and years, these didn't work very well. Uh, I think the corn doesn't always fit perfectly on... Uh, over the end of the tube so the change in pressure varies. Um, but last year I finally sorted it out and got it to work. Um, I doubled the strength of the pump, I put two pumps together and so that made the change in pressure more noticeable and that solved this one, the sucking it up. Uh, it, this one, the column was still unreliable I think because burnt bits of corn sometimes got stuck down the tube so this one, I just completely replaced it with an optical sensor, a beam sensor that goes from one side of the chamber to the other that detected the presence of the corn there. Uh, and actually there are two beam sensors in the chamber because then there's another one a little bit above it that detects when the corn's popped. Don't take your eyes off into or you will miss the amazing sudden eruption of cosmic What will it be, madam? The usual? The most difficult problem I had with sensors was on uh, Celeb. Um, I had to detect when the drone crashed into the building. Um, so uh, normally it would just be like that, but sometimes it was to the side. Uh, and then the building has overhangs, which I hadn't thought of when I made it. So it, it needs to sense whether it's being pulled up or pulled down as well. Uh, well, I tried all sorts of uh, mounting the drone in different ways, tried all sorts of different tilt sensors and um, accelerometers and that sort of thing. Um, but I couldn't get anything that uh, really worked as I wanted. So in the end, I went low-tech and uh, made my own little switch up there that detects most of the impact. Uh, and then another one at the back there that detects if it gets caught under a ledge. So, I don't know, sensors are never quite as straightforward as they seem. Um, they're always the unexpected. Well, that's the end of this episode, the end of my problem sensors. Um, I hope you found something useful in the video. Uh, <laughs> bye.